I want to apologize for a little lie. I said that the CRC was not used to correct data. That's not entirely true. We did a video a while back about how the Hamming code can be used for single error correction, double error detection. It turns out that the CRC can also be used to correct single bit errors. In this video, we're going to show you how. In our first video on the internal linear feedback shift registers, we created a 4-bit LFSR that allowed us to go through 15 different patterns of ones and zeros before it looped. It used four D flip-flops. All right, and remember they're put in order like this so that they can act as a shift register where the Q output of one D flip-flop drove the D input of the next one. And in fact, in, in a ring counter, we actually looped that all the way around so that whenever we had all of them, all of the D flip-flops connected to a single clock line, Whenever we had clock pulses, it would keep shifting and it came all the way around, shifting all the bits all the way around into each one of those latches. Now, when we did the internal uh, linear feedback shift register, what we did was we inserted an exclusive OR gate in between a couple of these D flip-flops. And we took the feedback from this last bit and we used it as one of the inputs into that exclusive OR. Now, whenever we had this arrangement, as long as we started with a non-zero value in those flip-flops, and as long as we never encountered the all-zero value in those flip-flops, we could actually cycle through different patterns of ones and zeros. And with the correct placement of an exclusive OR, we actually cycled through all patterns all 15 non-zero patterns for this 4-bit value. Now, whenever we went to the CRC, we used this exact same circuit, but we changed it around so that instead of using the most significant bit, and that's what we were looking at, is that this bit right here acted as the most significant bit in a shift register that was performing what looked like a long division in order to create the modulo. Instead, what we did was we took the, we disconnected the looping back and we put another exclusive OR gate here and we exclusive ORed the input, the input stream with the value that was coming back. And this circuit right here actually allowed us to perform, a, uh, to, to generate a CRC. We started out with all zeros in here. And then as the input came, as this input stream, these bits we wanted to generate an, a, a CRC for, as it went through, every time a one appeared in this location right here, what happened was we did a bitwise exclusive OR with a value 0011. That would have been our divisor in order to get the next value in that long division. What we're going to do in this video is show how this exact same circuit can be used not only to detect if an error has occurred in an input stream, but also to determine which bit it was that flipped, if just a single bit flipped. Now, in order to do this properly, there are a couple of things that we need to remember. First of all, for n bits, there are two to the n patterns of ones and zeros, right? So contained in here, there are two to the n patterns of ones and zeros. Now, if you remember from our CRC video, what we were looking at was as the stream came in and after it completed, and we brought in the check bits that were tacked onto the end of this input stream, the final result, if there were no errors, would have been all zeros. So the all zeros, all zeros condition, was no error, right? And what we have left are 15 different possible patterns of ones and zeros in those four bits that would allow us to determine, well, which bit had flipped. Well, that means that since we have four check bits, whoop, four check bits, looking at those four check bits, any one of those could be ones that flipped. So there are four different patterns that are gonna appear in here that are gonna represent check bit flips. How many does that leave over? Well, that leaves 
11 bits for single bit errors. What that means is that we have four error patterns that are going to be used to, that are going to be reserved to do the check bits, to identify errors in the check bits. That leaves 11 patterns left over for individual single bit errors within the data stream. So the data is going to have 11 bits. The check stream itself is going to have four bits. The check bits are going to be four bits. And then there's going to be the all zeros case, which means everything was cool. Sometimes my students get annoyed with me because I like using spreadsheets to show as data changes, as we propagate through cycles of, an, of a circuit, I can show how things change using the logic that is, uh, that is available in a spreadsheet. So here's a spreadsheet. At the top of my spreadsheet, I've got the linear feedback shift register that I just had on the board a moment ago. Notice that the exclusive ORs in this case have been replaced. The gates have been replaced with the operation symbol, the plus sign with the circle around it. So we've got the most significant bit we've got the four bits of the shift register a b c d we've got the most significant bit d getting looped around so that it is getting exclusive or with the input to go into a and then b is driven with the exclusive or of the output of a and the most exclusive excuse me the most significant bit d coming out of this this uh, shift register we are going to initialize this shift register with all zeros that's the way we started out whenever we were generating the crc and I'm going to create an input stream, which is just a bunch of zeros at this point. All right. And then my check bits are also zeros. Now, the way this circuit works, at the next cycle, I am going to take A and make it equal to the exclusive OR of the input stream with the most significant bit. All right. And then B, that's also going to be an exclusive OR, except this time with the A from the previous cycle and the D from the previous cycle. Now C and D, looking at the circuit right there, C and D just take the values that are in the flip-flop to their left. So C is going to equal the previous value that was contained in B, and D is going to equal the previous value that was contained in C. Now, this value right here, these four zeros right there, just show what the next cycle of A, B, and C, A, B, C, D would contain if we get a clock pulse. I'm going to take that and I'm going to copy it down through all the cycles that we would use to generate the CRC. Now, since I have all zeros in my input stream, right now it doesn't look like anything. It looks like we're just passing zeros, which in fact that's what we're doing, passing zeros through this bit through this internal linear feedback shift register. But if I put some data in here, notice that some ones start appearing in my uh, in my shift registers, and as they get passed through and as the exclusive ors occur, we get this final value at the bottom, which is what is supposed to look like our modulo function. Now remember that this D contains the most significant bit. So what I want to do is I want to take that D in the remainder. So this value, that, that, those bottom four cells, those, that's our remainder. Um, that's their CRC checksum. So we're going to take those bits and substitute it in for the check bits. And if everything worked correctly, we should get a zero remainder. So I'm going to take the most significant bit, put it in C0, and then just simply copy those down. And you'll see that my remainder turned into zero. That's exactly what we were looking for. All right, let's put this back so that it contains all zeros because what we're going to do now is show that a single bit flip is going to result in a unique pattern of ones and zeros in that final checksum, in those final check bits. So I've got a little table that I'm going to add over here, and we're going to start filling out this table to say which bit flipped corresponding to which bit value or is which final value. So down in this corner to help us figure things out, I'm going to actually do a conversion in from those binary bits into hexadecimal so I can yeah, more accurately, reliably fill out that table. So I'm just simply going to insert a little function in here. We're going to do binary to hexadecimal the concatenation of the D with the C 
with the B, and finally with the A. And so right now, we've got a zero in there. Remember that the D is the most significant bit, so you're going to be reading these right to left. Now, one at a time, I'm going to flip one of the, each one of these bits to a one. So we're going to start out with D zero. Whenever a one goes there, what happens is, is we end up getting a result of nine. So if we go down to nine in our table, that means that D zero flipped. All right. Now, if we come back here, and change d back to d0 back to a 0 and put d1 as a 1 that shows us notice down here that our error is now d so that's d1 so whenever we see a d as our result we know that we've got bit d1 flipped and i'm going to do this one at a time for each one of these bits and you're going to see that there's going to be a unique character or unique hexadecimal value for each one of these bits as I fill out this table. So D2 flips, that's an F. And so on. Be back in a second. Now before I put ones in each one of the check bits to show what pattern shows up for them, I want you to notice something about the values that I've filled out in our table so far. What I've got is for every single data bit that change, that corresponds to patterns of ones and zeros that contain at least two ones. For example, D10 set up as, it, it has an error code of three, that's 0011, 0011, two ones. You go down a little bit closer to the bottom, for example, D2, when D2 flips, all the bits turn to ones, right? Any case where there's exactly one one that is going to be flipped, that's going to be our four check bits. Let's show you how that works. Right now, if I put a one in C0, I get an eight as my error. The binary equivalent of a hexadecimal eight is one zero zero zero. That's one one. So when C0 flips, that's an eight. Whenever C1 flips, that's a four. Any guesses as to what the next two are going to be? I'm guessing that C2 is going to be a 2. It is. All right. And then I'm guessing also C3 is going to be the 1. I filled it in before I figured it out, but let's double check. All right. There we go. Yes, 1. All right. Now, what about this top case? Well, this top case right here, that is the everything's okay case, right? There were no errors. So for my 15 bits, my 11 bits of data, my four bits of check bits, there are 15 possible bits that can flip. That takes care of all 15 of those checks, which have, ex have one or more ones in the result. The all zeros case, that's the everything's okay case. Now, sure, that works great for having no data, but what happens if we put data? Well, let's put some ones in here. All right, now if you remember from the checksum, what it said was, or, or from the, you know, whenever we did the CRC, it said that we generate the remainder after putting a checksum, uh, the check bits of all zeros, and then you substitute the, the checks for the remainder that we got. So I'm going to put, starting with D is the most significant, one, zero, zero, zero and notice that our remainder is zero. Now, what happens if a bit flips? Well, if a bit flips, let's flip D6 to a one. So D6 is now a zero, D, it'll change it to a one. Our error right there is five, and if you go to our table, you see that D6 maps to the five. We figured out which bit flipped, just for a single bit error. So we'll put that one back. We get back to a result of zero. If I change from a one to a zero for D8, and I get the check is C. That means if you go in our table, you look at the check for C, you'll see that that's telling us that D8 was what, was what flipped. If we flip that back, whoops, that's D9. If we flip that back, we get back to our zero. Now, a couple of things to note. Remember that the bitwise exclusive OR acts not only like a 
carry a borrowless subtract, but it also acts like a carryless addition. That means that if one of these bits flips from a one to a zero, that's going to have the same effect as if one of the bits flipped from a zero to a one. A subtract is the same as an add when it comes to these borrowless subtractions and these carryless additions. Let's see, any other bits? Well, let's go ahead and check one of the check bits. Let's check flip C2, and we can see that C2, we get the two, which points to C2 as being the bit that flipped. All right, now, note that this only detects single bit errors. If I have two bits flipping, for example, let's say I make D4 a zero, and if we look down and we say it goes seven, and we go up to seven in our table, that shows that D4 flipped. But if we change to a five, we get a D, and that D says that D1 flipped, but we know that it was actually multiple bits. We had D4 and D5 both flipping. So we can't detect double bit errors with this. Now, I've talked about linear feedback shift registers for quite a few episodes now, and I sure hope I haven't driven any of you away. I'm not really sure what the next episode's going to be, but until then, remember that while the scope of what makes up a computer is immense, it's still all just ones and zeros.